with demand expected to come back. The question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle in right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, we got a great show today. A lot, a lot, a lot to talk about. But, you know, we talked last week, we were talking about the U.S. MCA and um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said that she thought that that she could get to a vote and that the prospects of USMCA was looking quite good. Now this week, you know, it seems like it's taking the back burner again. The impeachment process is is roaring ahead. And unfortunately, unfortunately, as a country, we're taking our eye off the ball. There's so many jobs out there that we should be creating, so many things we should do to build our economy. Trade agreements are very, very important, very, very important. And here is an agreement with our with with our two biggest trade partners. I mean, right here in our own hemisphere, right here on our own continent, who wants to trade with us, wants to expand business with the United States and the American worker. And we can't even get a vote to do trade with those right here amongst us. Something is very, very wrong with that. Well, yeah, there is. there are a lot of things really wrong with that. It's, it's the Democrats, and they're just not going to do that. I mean, what's really sad, if, if, if they were thinking about America and, and the middle class and the hardworking individuals and the auto industry, the farmers, all of these people would have the opportunity to benefit greatly from the passage of the U- USMCA, all of them. Well, it's, I mean, doing good for America shouldn't be a, a partisan event. It should be a celebration in a bipartisan fashion. And yet, it, it is, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to keep it back. I don't think they want to give Trump the, the ability to have a win. Um, we're so broken down in such an awful way. Let, let, let me give you an example. An editorial this week in the New York Post headline reads, I want no quid pro quo. These are the words coming from the president on a phone call with uh, Sutherland. On a phone call with Sutherland, he said, I want no quid pro quo. I tell Zelensky to do the right thing. And he said, I want nothing. Just do the right thing. Make it happen. Do your job. Then in the New York Times, <laughs> the headline reads, Sutherland has implicated the president and his top men. Now, either... He, there is a quid pro quo. There's not a quid pro quo. But, of course, we know it doesn't matter if it's a quid pro quo because it changed to extortion and bribery and stealing from children or anything else that they can come up with that will you know, stick and get emotionally excited with people in the polls and, and destroy his ability to get reelected, which I don't think is going to happen. But uh, when you see that, the same guy, the same ambassador, in one case he's being told specifically direct knowledge – I do not want a quid pro quo. I want nothing. Tell Zelensky to do the right job. New York Times takes the same guy and says he's implicated the president and his top men. Where do you go from there, Neil? I don't know. But we got to go to try to find ways to build this country. And, and certainly, uh, as you say, we're dysfunctional. We're completely dysfunctional. Yeah. There are some things out there, though, that we can do that will have bipartisan support. We talk a lot about how do we, how do we train our young people. How do we there's so many jobs. I'm an American manufacturer. So many jobs I can't fill because we just don't have a system here that gets our young people ready for manufacturing jobs. Yeah, we're going to bring our manufacturing jobs back, but we got to train our people for those type of jobs. And we and we're very terrible at that. But look at Germany. Look at Taiwan. Look at Korea. So many other countries have real apprenticeship opportunities for the young people. Less than 1% of our jobs in this country are apprenticeships. We're just not getting it done. But yet there seems to be bipartisan support for an apprenticeship program, training our people for the jobs that exist, very good paying jobs that exist in our economy in the manufacturing segment. We're very pleased to have on with us right now someone who knows a whole lot about this, 
Uh, Eric Selesnow, who is the senior advisor at Jobs for the Future. He specifically works on apprenticeships and getting our people ready uh, for for the type of jobs that exist in, in the new economy and in the new manufacturing economy. And he's recently uh, blogged, uh, and the title is, uh, To Transform the American Workforce System, Apprenticeship Needs Stronger Supports. Eric, welcome to Made in America. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about... Um, you know, and, and this has been a theme for us for, for many years, actually, uh, as we talk to manufacturers. And, and, and so many jobs are going unfulfilled. And so many of our young people are going and getting these four-year degrees, spending a lot of money, maybe 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 advanced degrees and spending even more money, and, and coming away with uh, moving back home and getting a job that has nothing to do with what they just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Yet right under our nose here are really great paying jobs good benefits, uh, but it, it requires some kind of skill. And, and, and you got a lot of people who can teach these skills in the job force, in the workforce, but yet, you know, we're not promoting that like our competitive countries around the world are and, and doing it very, very well. So why, if there is bipartisan support, bipartisan support for apprenticeships, why are we not getting it done? Okay, so that was 27 different questions there. I'll do my best, Neil. Um, and, you know, this country has come a long way in the last five years um, in terms of uh, the apprenticeship system in the U.S. There's been a um, 56% increase in the number of apprentices over the last five years. There's federal investment because of that bipartisan interest. It was supported, um, you know, started during the Obama administration. The Trump administration has continued to support that at the federal level. Um, uh, you know, there's bipartisan support. I was just up on the Hill last week talking to folks who really love the apprenticeship model for all the reasons you said, right? You know, the, the, the college debt is crushing. Um, the job, employers are always saying, well, gee, I need workers, but I can't find people with the right skills. I'm not happy with what I'm getting out of the high schools or some of the colleges. They don't have experience. They don't know. So I want to train my own workers and thus apprenticeship. But it's not really your grandfather's apprenticeship anymore, right? It's a much new modern version of it. And there has been some good news and successes because of the federal investment and because employers are getting more engaged in it. Uh, apprentices are happening. And they're happening. You know, the average age of an apprentice in this country is is you're probably going to think young, but the average age is pushing 30 years old of an apprentice, somebody who may have gone to college or dropped out of high school or is banging around the labor market, they finally get it. Um, uh, you know, our friends, as you mentioned, Germany, Switzerland, and others, their average age of apprentices is 17 years old. They're trying to uh, integrate uh, employers with high school curriculum to do on the job learning. So so I don't want to get too technical on that, but I would say this country is in the, in the early years of a transformation of learn and earn programs. Work, get paid while you're learning to train, go to related technical instruction, perhaps at a local community college, while you're getting the on-the-job training, and over a period of time, that leads to good wages and good jobs uh, for uh, manufacturers and a lot of other careers because they're growing in IT and healthcare as well. It's not your grandfather's apprenticeship program. Well, you know, it, the old statement, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, we, we see what's out there, and we need something, and somehow the American spirit's always been able to create what we've needed, and, and it created entrepreneurs. It created people who have their own paths to success. It, it, it led us towards the American dream and the opportunity it seems like, it, it, particularly in my generation, when I went to school, uh, and it had to go to college and all that other stuff, I had to do it. If I didn't do that, I was in big trouble. You know, right. I didn't just have to go to college, I had to go to graduate school, and then wound up in postgraduate. And um, it seemed like we had the wrong psychology. At the time, maybe it was the right psychology, but we all wound up with, with some degrees that, not we all, but a lot of people wound up with degrees that you couldn't do anything with. Unless you're going to teach right. college or something, one 17th century lit, that's great. I, I went that route for a while. But and now it seems like we've realized, you know, generation or so later, that we really need to go the other route. And, and we have all these you know, kids out there now looking for jobs, and particularly after the, you know, the crash 2008, 2009, that all of a sudden, oh, my God, you know, we have all these tradesmen out there, and maybe I should have been part of that. And the apprenticeship program would have really helped that, wouldn't it? Yep. 
Oh, absolutely. And it still does. And it's, it's not only just the trades, right? We have insurance companies who are doing apprenticeship programs, financial services, IT and healthcare, And still, you know, the bedrock of these programs are what I call the middle skills jobs, right? The, the uh, technicians, the uh, IT experts in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, building trades, electricians, plumbers, pipe fitters, great jobs, great wages. Um, and, you know, our friends in the unions for the last hundred years have figured out how to do it without any government help, right? They have employers cover some fee, apprentices cover some of the fees, and they've got some really good programs. But also this has expanded into, you know, non-union work and non-union construction and IT and healthcare and all of that. So, so people are seeing the value of learn and earn. And as we often call it, uh, gentlemen, we often call it, um, you know, the other four-year uh, degree is apprenticeship because those post-secondary credentials that they get in apprenticeship programs are often going to community colleges, getting degrees and certifications along with their on-the-job learning without the crushing debt, right? And so, you know, it, it's the other pathway to the middle class and it's the other four-year degree. And any apprentice, I don't care if you're an electrician, a plumber, a pipe fitter, that is as equally as valuable, if not more valuable in many cases, as a, as a two- or four-year degree. And so we're, we're just seeing that it's not a linear pathway anywhere, right? Um, and the, the really interesting thing, if I can go on just for another minute, is this growth in high school apprenticeships that's happening in communities across the country where employers don't want to lose talent, right? Kids go away to college, they leave their hometown, they go to the city, they go to college, and they don't come back. And so employers are getting more engaged with their communities to offer these learn and earn strategies um, to really hook these young men and women. To, you know, they're, they're getting paid while they're working. They're getting their schooling paid for. Uh, many times the company is doing that. The employer is doing that. And when they complete their apprenticeship, oftentimes the employer will say, well, gee, you've been an engineering tech for me uh, in my manufacturing plant, but I'm going to send you to the state college now to get your four-year degree to be an engineer. So these pathways to the middle class are very effective. I've seen young people and older uh, workers, you know, be able to afford cars and houses and, and really live the, uh, the middle class American dream because of these learn and earn types of programs and without the co- crushing college debt. Hey, Eric, we got to take a quick break. We're going to be back just in a moment with Eric Sellers now. You don't want to miss it. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman, and we're together with Eric Sellers now, who's a senior advisor at Jobs for the Future. Hey, Eric, I'm, a, I'm an American manufacturer, and, you know, we, we, we have to do business around the world, and we got to compete uh, around the world. we got to compete with people bringing products into the United States. It's a very, very dynamic situation. It's a very tough situation. But one of the things that we're at a complete disadvantage on here in the United States, and especially if you want to get products to market very quickly and to get them to market very competitively, and and, and the risk factor of bringing, say, a new appliance to the to the marketplace that's got to get tooled up and hey look you know you can't call them right all the time and, and you, you could spend a lot of money on tooling costs you know and these are the 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 the, the tools that or the dies that you shoot um injection molding machines that you shoot plastics into or your form metals you know to make these beautiful products unfortunately a lot of that skill has moved out of the United States, and it's sort of a generational thing. I mean, once you lose your tool and die makers, you've you've lost an amazing advantage. Now, on the and conversely, China has really developed that part of their their market, and and their ability to bring products to market very quickly, very competitively. Tooling costs are one tenth that of the United States. So how do we how do we accomplish? You know, bringing back and reinventing our economy with all these great paying jobs. Uh, but you need you need these apprenticeships to help keep these skills in our country. But once you lose those skills, how do you bring them back? Yeah, no. And that's that's you just explained what happened at a couple of times the last 30 years in this country, once in 2008, 2009. And then previous to that, I think, in the 80s, when things started going down downhill. And, and you know, so so young people or workers got away 
from those sorts of jobs and skills, right? And so, you know, what we're seeing now is right, if employers don't have the workers that they need, they cannot grow, they cannot compete, they cannot expand. And I would agree with you, they need to do it quickly. And so, and, and even now with low unemployment rates, right, it's still really important to do it. A lot of employers say, oh, I can just hire anybody to do this. But other employers will say, no, I can't hire anybody. I've got to grow my own worker. I got to keep people in my community. I got to provide a pathway to a good job and a good wage because it's good for my company. And guess what? It's good for your worker as well. So, so many more companies are going to engage in that, but a lot of them just don't understand. You know, these job training programs are out there. They don't understand the apprenticeship system. There's a lot of myth and misperception about them. And what we try to do is work with employers and communities and make partnerships with employers and colleges and other stakeholders to create these you know, model programs where people are earning and learning, getting an hourly wage, um, getting the on-the-job learning, get the related theory and classroom instruction while they're learning, because most people, I, I learn better that way anyway, um, and, you know, grow your own workers and keep them. And, you know, the, the Department of Labor would tell you that 94% of apprentices stay on the job, right? So that reduces churn for these companies. It reduces the cost of people coming and going, investing in them, and they leaving. There's just some sort of connection between employers and workers, and then they work together on this training scheme. It creates good, solid workers. And I, and I think, you know, it, it's hard to skill people up quickly, right? Um, so if you've got something coming online, you know, you've got to have a pipeline of workers at the ready. And I think that's what's driving some companies to get involved in high schools and create a pipeline of workers, not just train, oops, i got to hire 20 people because a new job came through. But let's get that pipeline planned and going. Well, you know, I, I think you hit on a couple of interesting things. One, uh, college debt, you know, for the kids uh, that go to college now, we have we have more than one point three trillion dollars in debt in the United States. Yep. These kids graduate. And, you know, it, it, in some cases, it, it's silly to think they're going to get out of it making fourteen dollars, thirteen dollars, fifteen dollars an hour. All their money is going to go to service that debt. So they really need something because they got to make money. And so, you know, it, it seems like the concept of apprentice is it was it was from my perspective from a kid was a European concept. I mean, I hate to say something as as pedestrian as this, but the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, uh, from Fantasia was a European concept in Disney's uh, cartoon Fantasia, and we saw that. And you know, Mickey was working, you know, for the Sorcerer, but it was European, and and but not here. Why why Europe and not U.S. So you'd, you'd probably be interested to know, so who's led a lot of the expansion and apprenticeship the last five years in this country has been German companies and Swiss companies because um, they do it so well. And they've, uh, you know, there was a European invasion, if you will, in the early 2000s in North Carolina. And Siemens organized 20 or 30 companies in that area, Apprenticeship Carolina, and they started doing high school-based apprenticeship 24 years ago in North Carolina. And now in South Carolina, in the city of Charleston, they have the Charleston Youth Apprenticeship Program, a partnership with Trident Community College, the Chamber of Commerce, the school system, and companies like uh, Bosch and Cummings and Boeing are training these young people in these complex uh, ma advanced manufacturing jobs. And they are, you know, they're like German models, but you know what? They're USA models. And our USA apprenticeship system is pretty darn good. Um, it is high rigor, high quality, and high standards. We just don't have enough employers buying into it. Now, the building trades and constructions, they've been doing it for 100 years. They figured it out. Um, and again, whether it's not union or non-union, it doesn't matter. They figured out how to do it because it's in their like the self-interest to do it, and it works for their employers and it works for the people they hire. But as I said, we're seeing it now in the insurance industry, healthcare, cybersecurity, uh, high school program, the college programs, um, where they're you know growing their own workers, paying them getting the supervision, getting the related uh, uh, instruction while they're at it. So, so there's a lot of innovation happening. Um, and, you know, the, what I think most employers don't get about apprenticeship is the rigor that's involved. So the average apprenticeship program in the U.S. takes three years, um, but you're getting paid the whole time. It's not like you're in school sitting at a desk and not getting paid, right? So you're getting paid and you're getting that education at the same time. Um, there are shorter-term programs for, like, pharmacy technicians, and then there are longer ones for, you know, really skilled electricians and skilled plumbers and pipe fitters and steam fitters, right? Um, so there's a number of ways to do it, but employers don't know much um, how to connect with these programs, or they're skeptical about it. They think, oh, if I do an apprenticeship, I'm going to turn into a union shop, or only unions do apprenticeships, and that's not accurate at all. That's why I say it's not your grandfather's system. There's a whole lot of new types of companies. There's a whole lot of new models out there. 
there and there's a lot of people in the states that can help. So, you know, if I'm a manufacturer in Indiana, I'm going to call the Indiana Department of Apprenticeship. Or if I'm a a big coast-to-coast trucking company, I might call the U.S. Department of Labor. But there's been a lot of federal investment to expand apprenticeship back to your bipartisan interest in this and there's a lot of resources out there to help companies build apprenticeship programs they don't have to do it by themselves so eric what we're going to do we're going to get you back so you can tell us exactly how one goes about finding an apprenticeship and how companies can also learn from you as far as creating them Uh, very very important for our economy eric we thank you for being with us eric sell is now uh from the jobs for the future. He's a senior advisor there and incredibly knowledgeable about this topic. So very important. Eric, thanks for being on the show. Pleasure to be with you. Remember, there's more than one pathway to the middle class. Take care, guys. Thank you. Coming up, we have Jamie Hall from the Heritage Foundation. He's a research fellow of quantitative analysis. Very, very big job there. And we're going to talk about how does Medicare for all hurt the American worker? You don't want to miss it. Made in America. higher at the open, stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, there's nothing more than education and preparing our people, our young people, and all of our people. doesn't matter where you are in life for the economy that exists in the many, many opportunities that are going unfulfilled. Apprenticeships, very good, very constructive, and they are working wonders for many countries in Europe and Asia. We need to work wonders in our country as well. Rich, when you came in today to the studio, I mean, uh, you were you were quite lit up about the Democrat uh, debate this week, this past week, and specifically about Elizabeth Warren in Medicare for all and how, you know, it's, uh, I mean, hundreds of millions. I don't know what it is, but a massive, massive amount of people is just going to go on to this, costing trillions and trillions of dollars. Just people who are, you know, just very happy with their health care already. I mean, you know, why why blow up the whole system, you know, for for the many, many people that are very satisfied um, to try to fix a problem? That, you know, hey, look, you just did Obamacare. The Democrats did Obamacare. That was supposed to be the be all end all. And now that is just like already it's a Republican idea, according to many of these people running for president, because that was just totally, totally unacceptable. You know, it was not even worth worth uh, building upon. I mean, this, you know, it's not going to be the Republicans that that get rid of Obamacare. It's going to be the Democrats. Who would have thought about that? You know, Just a short while ago. I agree. I agree. And, and it looked like in the last few months that the Democrats were coming down on Obamacare and they were running away from it pretty quickly. But I find interesting Elizabeth Warren's comments in the debate this week. You know, she was very animated. We can get into that a little bit later because she did say, you know, first thing, first day, I'm going to get 135 million Americans, 135, no, 135 million people. And I'm not so sure she said Americans, 135 million people. Well, we'll immediately go on on uh, Medicare for all. Oh, how wonderful this is going to be. I can't wait. And uh, uh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a very exciting moment. And I'm anxious to hear what we have to do because I'm not so sure that's the way to go. Well, you know, very uh, rarely do we have someone who's a a, a professional uh, a person in quantitative analysis. This is the person to go to Vegas with. This is the person that you want to go to Bellagio. Just saying. And when it, Just you're, saying. When you're a quantitative analyst and you're working at the <laughs> Central Intelligence Agency or the White House, it means that you really got to have your stuff together, right? You betcha. So let's <laughs> let's apply that. Let's apply that to some of these things like healthcare or immigration or education. We just talked about education. There's all kinds of ways to analyze uh, this data that's out there to see, you know, what comes out of it. We're very pleased to have with us Jamie Hall from the Heritage Foundation, who is a senior fellow in quantitative analysis. 
Jimmy, welcome to Made in America. Me on your show. Thank you hey, very it's, much. It's for great to be with you. Show. And mm-hmm. uh, so, how will Medicare for All hurt the American worker? Well, you have Bernie Sanders out there claiming, right? Folks are going to pay more in taxes, of course, but at the end of the day, they're going to be better off because they're going to pay no premiums, co-payments, or deductibles. And uh, my colleague Ed Hazelmeyer and I just looked at that claim, analyzed it very closely, very carefully across all represent- representative American households, and we found it's just not true. Uh, when we crunch the numbers in a Medicare for All plan that's actually paid for, we find that roughly three quarters of Americans are going to be worse off financially than they are today. And can you can you um, what what can you quantify what means worse off? Um, that means that they're going to pay more in taxes than they save from eliminating their health care premiums, their copayments, and their deductibles. Uh, that means that on average. Uh, folks are going to need to pay, working households are going to need to pay uh, about $10,000 extra in taxes in order to cover everybody under Medicare for All. Uh, that 87% of working households that currently have employer-sponsored coverage are going to end up being worse off because of all of these extra taxes that they're going to have to pay, even though they won't will no longer have to pay for their um, healthcare premiums. So you know, this is—I just love listening to this. This is amazing. Of course, they don't. Dis- we don't hear this anywhere except maybe on Fox or something. But um, uh, it's—it's—it's. It, it's, this is like you know, two point Obamacare. Remember, they were saying this is going to be great, and you can you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan. We're going to reduce twenty five hundred dollars a year from your premiums, and everyone's going to have health care. The truth of the matter is, nobody was going to get health care. Premiums are going to go up. Millions of people lost their health care plans, and the, and the quality of the health care that you were going to get went down to nothing practically. A, a lot of doctors didn't want to take Obamacare, and if you were lucky enough to get somebody who did, you waited a long time to get anything, and, and it just wasn't happening. So it turned out to be, as I said later, we were counting on the stupidity of the American public, the American voter, to go for this. It seems like this is like, you know, Obamacare 2.0 in terms of them lying to us when she said, oh, my God. And, and, and well, Bernie says the same thing. Eighty seven million Americans don't have health care or they're underinsured, whatever that means. And uh, we got to help them. And this is going to be great because Elizabeth said it this week. Everyone's going to be part of this. And after two years of doing this, they're going to see how great it works. Not exactly correct, is it? No, no, it's not. And um, this it's important for your listeners to understand that Medicare for All is really Medicare in name only. Uh, it just polls really well when they call it Medicare for All. But once folks realize that they actually plan to outlaw private health insurance in the existing Medicare program and force everyone onto this new government-run system, folks aren't so happy about that. Hey, hey Jamie, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're with Jamie Hall from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he's a, a quantitative analyst. Uh, he's doing a lot of work on a lot of topics, and we're talking right now about health care and Medicaid for all. You don't want to miss it. Still much more to come. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman, and we are together with Jamie Hall from the Heritage Foundation. So, Jamie, I mean, a lot of people think, and a lot of Democrats think, that Medicare for All, I mean, is a losing proposition, that you cannot get elected nationally on Medicare for All. You talked about polling, that Medicare for All, you know, it seems to poll well, but the concept of Medicare for All and the price tag doesn't seem to poll very well, especially in the swing states that's going to elect the next president of the United States, does it? That's right. Um, I mean, ask your listeners, do they want to have to pay an extra 21 cents on every dollar that they earn from the first dollar to the last dollar to fund this program? I can't imagine that very many of them do. How much, how much, you know, if they're going to spend 21 cents more in taxes, 
what is the offset that they would save in health care? Do you have a, a, a you know, so what's the beta between, you know, what they would have spent and what they would have saved? So the uh, Medicare for All program is actually going to require the federal government to raise an extra $2.3 trillion in revenue each year to fund this program. Uh, For the typical family, what's going to happen is because they have to pay all these extra taxes. For example, let's say the median income married couple with two kids currently getting um, insurance through their employer, those folks are going to end up losing over $9,000 net of their taxes and their health care expenses under Medicare for All. That's about the same amount as a family like that would spend on food each year. Wow, Rich, I mean, that's a massive number. I mean, it's, it's hard to fathom, you know, the, uh, the people living paycheck to paycheck, like many of us do, that you would, you would be upside down $9,000. I mean, that's a fortune. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and I'm a little confused because I thought in the last time and, the, and when uh, – when uh, Obama was running the second time, the first time, that uh, uh, they they were saying that the Republicans were, you know, taking grandma in the uh, in the wheelchair and shoving her over the cliff. I really think it's the Democrats who are doing that, don't you think? Isn't that weird? Um, I mean, that's really pathetic. I mean, tell well, people I, you're going to uh, someone earning forty five thousand dollars a year, fifty thousand dollars. Hey, you're going to lose ten thousand dollars. You know, so everybody can have free health care. I mm-hmm. don't know. That, that's not going to go over too well. Even the folks who are currently on programs like Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, where they do have comprehensive government-funded care, are going to have to pay these taxes as well. So you're talking about the folks who are already poor enough that the government has determined that they need to assist them with their health care. They're still going to have to pay these extra taxes, but they're not even going to get any extra benefits under this. And they're going to find that their household income drops uh, over $5,000 a year on average. There's, there just are very few people who actually benefit from this program financially. Well, 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 well they're, 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 you're right. And those are the elites who are running the program. You see, the way I see it, if this is a, a program that's trillions and trillions of dollars, follow the money. Someone, this money is power, and, and power controls, and power continues controlling unbelievably stronger every time, every time, every time. And power so corrupts. Who, wait a minute. Who's making the money? Someone's making a lot of money in this, and somebody wants to be part of that money. So I say well, follow the money, and you'll find out who's going to make, who's going to do well and who's supporting it. Well, the, certainly there, there are a lot of bureaucrats who would benefit from this program. Um, That's also, right. When, when we run the numbers, it does, because we're, we're assuming that they pay for this through a payroll tax, the folks who are retired currently appear to benefit um, under this program. But it's important to remember uh, that those are generally the folks who need the health care the most and who are going to suffer the most if they have to wait in line with everyone else for all the free services that they're getting under this program. Um, you know, it's just it's going to be a disaster, not only for the people who look like they're going to lose money under this, but also for a lot of the folks who really need the good quality health care who end up stuck in line waiting because of all the extra demand from folks who just don't even really need um, certain services just going to the doctor because it's free. Yeah, I mean, it was just totally overwhelm the system, right? I mean, it was just totally overwhelm the system. Yeah. And that and that creates yeah. control for the federal government. I mean, like who gets it and who doesn't get it, right? I mean, it's like mm-hmm. it's going to totally overwhelm the system. That's like, right. It just can't it just can't handle that burden. That's yeah, right. and the and, other countries that have done these programs like this, right? It's the 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 way to save on cost is to deny care to the people who need it the most. Eventually, that's what's going to happen here if you go with Medicare for All. Wow. Um, let's, in, in, in the short time that we have left, Jamie, I mean, you also do work on immigration. So what does your quantitative analysis tell us about immigration? Uh, well, what we find when we look at the numbers on what immigrants are paying in taxes versus what they're receiving in services is that Basically, um, high-skilled immigrants, those with a college education or better, are actually um, net benefits to the American taxpayer. Those folks are generally paying more in taxes than they're receiving in health, education, and other welfare benefits. 
but the, the lower skilled immigrants um, actually end up costing American taxpayers quite a bit of money. And in what what's quite a bit of money? Well, it can be over the lifetime of, for example, um, a high school dropout immigrant. It could end up costing over six hundred thousand dollars. Wowza! I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money. And, and 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 many of those coming across our border are those who do not have high school educations, and so therefore. They're costing six hundred thousand dollars for every every uh, taxpayer. I mean, they're costing us well, yeah, six hundred thousand dollars for exactly. everyone who comes yeah. across. Well, think about this. Let's, let's take us back to our discussion about Elizabeth Warren the other night. She said, "Wait a minute. One of the things I'm going to do is give one hundred thirty-five million, you know, um, 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 uh, p- folks free health care. I'm going to also take down parts of the border, the the parts that we don't need." She said this. The parts that we don't need, we're going to take them down. Now, imagine if we're giving away free health care to all these people and young people and children and babies. What do you think that's going to do to immigration? Particularly if we start taking down parts of the border wall that have been going up. I would think, maybe I'm wrong, and Eric can tell us, I think it's going to increase the number of people coming here. They're going to be more encouraged. They're going to go, let's go for it. Don't you think? Of course. Of course. It's going to be a magnet to bring in more illegal immigrants, um, especially anybody who is searching for a place to get care that's being denied to them in uh, the country where they currently live. If they can get here and get it for free, uh, they're going to come and take it. And eventually we'll have to deny it for them, but also for the American people in order to keep the to keep the costs down. Um, and that's that's just not right. Yeah, Jamie. Hey, hey, Jimmy, you've been a wonderful guest. I mean, it's still a lot more to talk about, and uh, we really appreciate your work there at the Heritage Foundation. We really appreciate all the good folks there. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. And um, if your listeners are interested in learning more about what I do and what my colleagues do at Heritage, uh, just just go to heritage.org, and um, this report and all, a lot of others are there for you to see. Hey, Jamie, thanks for that. Thanks for reminding us. We really appreciate you. We'll, we'll talk to you. We'll talk again soon. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I are going to have some final thoughts for the day. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you read a lot. I read a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. But, I mean, just everything is getting pushed off. You know, there's just like nothing out there on anything. I mean, very important things about our economy, about China, uh, even Brexit and what's happening in Europe. And, you That's know, what's been happening very in the UK. quiet it's, this it's, week. Even though there's very a month because of the impeachment thing. I yeah. mean, like it's sucking all the air out of everything. And it's it's you know, I just wish, you know, they'd get it over with. Okay, Democrats, you're going to impeach the president. You knew that you knew that, you know, even the night that he was elected and and you never thought he'd get elected. But the night that he got elected, you're already impeaching the guy. Right. So get it over with. Impeach him. You know, this was already preordained. It didn't matter what it was, if there was a crime or not a crime. Did it raise up to to an impeachable offense? It never, ever mattered. Okay. So get it over with. And Republicans, okay, you do your work and get it over with very quickly, too. And acquit the guy because, you know, we know that's going to happen. So just get it over with and let's get back to building this country and making this country a better place and hopefully get that out of our system. Hey, look, there's a presidential election coming up. You're going to have a lot of time to debate all these things, important things. Let's get on to who should be our next president What are the policies that this country needs? What does the policies that are entrepreneurial, our small businesses, our risk takers, our inventors, they're just sitting there right now watching this this train wreck that we got going on in Washington. And we see right now that the economy is not growing at the at the rate that it has been over the last couple of years. Right. We're seeing that maybe in the fourth quarter, it's it's going to take a a, a bit of a hit. Why? Not because. You know, we don't want to go out there and build this country and work hard and do all the wonderful things. It's just because, you know, our 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 our, our Washington political elite are just so 
completely off the rails and dysfunctional, you know, we're taking the eye off the ball, right? In international trade and so many different things in tax reform, regulatory reform, we could be doing all those wonderful things right now, but we're not. Let's just get it over with and get back to work. Well, that's what a lot of the um, the GOP members of the House Intelligence Committee. Now, there's an oxymoron. The House Intelligence. Uh, House Intelligence Committee. At least when you throw in Adam Schiff, another oxymoron. Uh, but they're saying, you know what? Look, you knew you were going to impeach him. You said it. Before he was elected, you said it after he was elected. Al Green spoke on the on the House floor that, you know, we're going to impeach and we have to we have to do this. We're going to, you know, Maxine Waters was out there saying we're going to impeach and we have to impeach 45. I mean, that's that's the mantra, impeach 45 and so forth. So the GOPers were saying, well, you know what, let's do it. You didn't do your job in the House. You control the House. You didn't do your job. The most unfair, most unfair situation, the most unfair situation to a person being charged not to face the person who's accusing them and not to give due diligence and so forth to and due process of law. It doesn't exist right now in the, in the House Intelligence Committee, along with a lack of intelligence, except on the GOP side, of course. But um, <laughs> I know what side you're on. Yeah. But they did say, you know what? And then we're going to go to the Senate and the rules are going to be different. We're going to be in the Senate, and the rules are going to be different because we're going to have witnesses, and we are going to get the whistleblower, the alleged whistleblower, and we are going to get, by the way, Adam Schiff, and we are going to go after and bring in all the witnesses that we need to tell the truth and be transparent, and this ain't going anywhere. But we're going to be transparent about it. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get it over with because we knew it was a far-gone conclusion. It'll be interesting to see what the articles of impeachment will say. Of course, there's no direct evidence, but we were told by a Democrat just last week, well, hearsay is much more valuable in many cases than direct evidence. That doesn't work for a traffic ticket. (laughs) Well, this is the Socialist Party of America that is conducting this this impeachment uh, process. And remember, this isn't the trial. You know, this is the... Exploratory, collecting. Exploratory. The, ex- sort of like a colonoscopy, the- <laughs> don't you think? I would. It, colonoscopy is exploratory. Well, that's a Well, visual. this is pretty close to Adam Schiff, just saying. Yeah. But in, instead of, you know, doing the things that we should be doing to build our country, and hey, look, there's so much work to do, and our competitors are out there, and they're not asleep at the wheel, and they're building their countries. And we, we talked about apprenticeships and the things that's going on in Europe. We know in Asia, you know, they've been very successful. Um, getting people trained for their economies. Uh, We're just not focused here in this country right now, and that's a scary, scary thing, scary thought. Rich, I really enjoyed being with you today. Like I do every week. Yep. But unfortunately, we're out of time again. I know. But don't dismay, because we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your jobs. 